well, if many, many papers have been flagged, how plausible is it that they're all just honest errors? It comes to the point that, you know, maybe three strikes and you're out. Welcome to Everything Hurts. My name is Dan Quintana from the University of Oslo. I'm here with James Heathers from Cypherskin and a very special guest, Dorothy Bishop, who is a professor of developmental neuropsychology at the University of Oxford. Thanks for joining us again, Dorothy, for the second time. Yeah, it was great to be here again. Thanks for having me. Well, the last time that we spoke was in June 2018. Uh, and we covered the adoption of open science practices. So before we get into the episode proper, I want to ask you how you think this adoption is coming along since we last spoke in 2018. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess not as fast as I would like, but it is progressing. And I think that the encouraging things are principally that it's being picked up more and more by big organisations. So, for example, um, the EU, who fund me, even though we've just left the EU, I have money from the European uh, Research Council, they have just started their own version of an open science journal. So previously I worked for the Wellcome Trust, who had this Wellcome Open Research Journal, which is a very interesting publishing model. Um, and this has basically been copied by the ERC. So that's big because it's they, they want all their funded people to publish in this journal. And the model is one where you, in effect, initially just post your preprint. So you, it gets published regardless. But then if it gets positively reviewed, um, it is then an official publication. So it then gets listed in databases and things. And it, it's, you know, it's no longer marked as not peer reviewed. Um, and it's free to publish in if you're funded by ERC. Um, so, you know, they're really trying to, and it's all open, They, you know, requirements for open data and it's all open access. So I think, you know, it, it, it seems sometimes very slow because the individual scientists haven't been exactly fast to adopt new practices, but they're going to be forced to if more and more funders insist on it. So, and I think the funders are moving in that direction. Um, and, you know, even governments and people are beginning to think, well, you know, if we're paying for research, it's got to be open. Yeah, Dan, Dan has been complaining about that for years. And it's like, why, why, don't these, why don't these funding bodies come up with their own solution? It's their stuff. And, yeah, I mean, I hesitate to say uh, straight from Dan's mouth to the entire European Union's ears, but it's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of happened. <laughs> It, it it sort of it sort of did happen. It's actually it really really close to, um, how how you've always perceived what the what that funding network should be doing that derives the most value for them. Dan, as someone who's obviously a lot closer to it than me, and now now they are. And I I sort of quickly looked. I got I got this email from them because they're trying to encourage people like me now to publish in this sort and. I quickly checked and I thought, I bet they don't have registered reports, but they've got registered reports. Hey. Nice. Yeah, you can, you can link to that episode too, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I think it's really encouraging as well because quite most of the agencies within Europe, if the ERC is doing something, they usually adopt those same sort of practices. So it'll be interesting to see whether um, other countries uh, agencies are actually doing the same sort of thing. And it makes a lot of sense if you were the funder, you were saving a bunch, I mean, it makes a lot of sense in a number of ways, but purely from a financial perspective, you are saving a lot of money if you are setting up your own journal. And you can check that the people you're funding are, are obeying all your sort of requirements for open data and all of that, because these journals won't let you get something through unless you have, I mean, I've published with Welcome Open Research, they're really strict. They say, you know, where's your data? They check it's actually there. And they have a lot of requirements that they want you to sign up to before they will actually make the paper public. So um, I think I think it's a good thing. It's gone slowly, partly because all of these organisations are huge, great beasts with tons of bureaucracy, and you know they, they don't make changes quickly. But I think it's getting there. Mm. And I imagine the, the plague didn't help because this is a reasonably recent development and uh, yeah. the, the precise point in time that you start telling every ERC-funded researcher in Europe, which is well, good, at least six of them, um, you have to completely change your 
uh, your publication practices in some cases because a lot of people will not be familiar with those publication requirements even now. Uh, depending on the field. I mean, they're not insisting that you publish there, but they're encouraging it and they're making it free. At least I I don't think they're insisting, but they're very much. uh, So, you know, you could carry on in the old ways, if you, I guess, if you wanted to, but I think they are also very much, they're going to get upset if they find that your data aren't open, for instance. Uh, Still on the topic of journals, uh, there's been a new community-run journal which launched in your research area, Dorothy, of language development called Language Development Research. I think it launched last year. What has the response been like within your field for this community-run journal? I'm not sure. It's it's a bit too young. I'm, I'm on the advisory board, and I'm very impressed with how they have acted. I mean, they've really been... Uh, the, the, or they've been really sort of consulting everybody and getting us all to agree to certain terms and conditions. I've actually just submitted something. I submitted a register report there hey. uh, a while ago, and they've taken quite a while to process it, but it has been the pandemic. Um, but I think the, the general attitude is positive. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's early days. We'll see how what sort of submissions that they get. Um but I think there's been a need for it in that field. There is there is um, a good journal called the Journal of Child Language, which, again, all does actually um, offer registered reports and so on. But um, I think a lot of us have been feeling that there's not been many good outlets for you know, research in this area. And there's quite a lot of research. So I think I think it would be good. I think it would be, again, a bit of a sort of it will set a bar for other journals to try and follow. It's, it's a, if you start a new journal you can really institute all the practices you want from the word go, and it's much, much easier. Quite often you hear people talking about, um, oh, I, I want to submit my work, but I don't have the funding, and then somebody will chime in on Twitter going, hey, why don't you submit to one of these overlay journals or, or one of these community-run journals, and they'll say, that one doesn't exist for my field. So to see these journals popping up for different fields is really good and going to give researchers another option. And, and it's almost the other end of the spectrum. You have this um, stuff like the, the the European Research Council journal, which is funding researchers from there. And on the other end, you have these community-run journals. So it's nice to see uh, some of the issues that we're actually coming up against in journal publishing being addressed in in different ways. And they're both they're both good solutions, I think. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, and I think they're going to, with luck, squeeze out you know the big publishers who have just had that monopoly for so long. Now, you recently wrote a piece on publication ethics. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? And particularly, why did you write about this? There, there are so many things that you could potentially spend your time on when it comes to your blogging, but why this issue in particular? Yeah, I was I was sort of from I normally when I blog, it's normally because I get cross about something. <laughs> And I want to put the world to rights. So um, I read this piece by somebody from, I think it was a Society for Microbiology or something, um, which, of course, is not my area. But it was they are they were a learned society who publish journals in that field. And it was a sort of defense of themselves against accusations that they had been very slow to act when uh, it was drawn to their attention that there were papers with problems in them principally drawn to their attention by the amazing Elizabeth Bick, who I know you've featured in Hertz podcast. I don't really go around putting people on a pedestal, but if there's if there's a single one available, I think I, I think she can have it. She's she's kind of my hero. So so she has always complained that, you know, she writes to these journals and says, hey, you know, here are these weird figures that uh, really uh, seem to have a lot of duplications in them or things that have been photoshopped in and out. And, you know, like nothing happens um, or she might get an acknowledgement if she's lucky and they say, oh, we'll look into it. And then nothing happens. Or quite often, uh, if they do look into it and they agree that something a bit weird has been going on, they then just allow a correction. So they allow the original author who had this Photoshop stuff to just sort of change it. Um, so. I got, on the one hand, irritated by this because they were saying things, this person who wrote it, some editor, I think, was just sort of saying, um, well, you know, usually when these things happen, this is just an honest error. And I thought, how do you know that? And, you know, the things that Elizabeth Bick is picking up, she's very careful not to accuse people of fraud, but most of them, you look at it and you you don't need her to accuse you. This is ridiculous. You know, somebody's clearly 
copied and pasted and expanded and, you know, so on. It's, it's obviously uh, made up data. Um, so they're saying on the one hand, it's, it's, it's very often it's honest error. Um, and I thought, well, that, that irritated me because I thought they're just, um, you know, assuming that. And I think that's often not true. But then they made, you know, reasonable points that if you think there is malpractice, you can't just dive in. And I mean, James has been through this. I know with, you know, when you're complaining about some of the papers where you found dodgy data, you have to be very, very careful. You can't just sort of say some, you know, somebody's fraudulent or whatever. And you've also experienced the sort of huge amount of time it takes to get anybody to take any action. So it's a similar thing with these dodgy figures. Um, but they were saying, well, you know, we have to be very careful and we and we as publishers, it's not up to us to pick up fraud. So if we think there's fraud, we have to report it to the institution and then the institution will come, you know, convene a committee and the committee will take a very long time because, you know, all these poor people on the committee who have really got other jobs to do, but have been pulled into this committee and then they've got to get the data. And of course, it all takes a long time. And I thought, yeah, that's that's fair enough. But. I, I realise they're completely missing a very key point. Key point is I don't care if it's fraud or not, really. I mean, I do, but, you know, that's not the relevant thing that they should be doing. What is important is whether it's correct or not. If there's an error in it, it should be taken out of the literature and you can spend three years investigating whether it was fraud or not if, as much as you like. But you should be removing it from the literature as fast as you possibly can, because otherwise it's going to hang around there might get picking up citations, might be influencing other people who might be basing their PhDs on it. So I had this sort of aha moment that, you know, this is the problem that the publishers are really not seeing what is important here. They're just assuming that if you pick something up, you're accusing somebody of fraud and that's, you don't want to do that lightly and therefore you've got to have these massive investigations. But they're really very reluctant to just withdraw things on the basis that here's an obvious error in something. So that that was really my, um, you know, my fulmination on Twitter was about that. So uh, not on Twitter, but on my blogs and on Twitter. Yeah, this is the, the whole the whole two sided ethical question. Um, as as might be expected, I have some reasonably strong opinions on this myself. Um, and uh, I, I read the blog post that uh, what you wrote was based on. And uh, I have I have some component observations. One of them is the fact that when, whenever someone writes about this from the publisher or the EIC kind of side, they put visual errors into a great big bucket, and the bucket simply has a label on the outside that says potentially wrong, and that is opposed to everything else that is presumably okay. And I've never seen anyone in either one of those positions ever talk about the kind of mechanics of what the errors actually represent. I've never seen them split them into any kind of groups. And very obviously you can. If you have to assemble a figure because there's multiple pieces of visual information and you're putting them into some kind of tableau, it's perfectly possible, especially if your paper has 20 or 30 figures and each figure is... God damn it, licorice. Each figure is... Ah, oh, I got stabbed. I'm sorry. This will be a cat interrupted podcast. Um, each each figure is itself a little pastiche of things that are going on. I'm sure errors happen. Um, you have, you have, especially in something like microbiology, you you have multiple teams with multiple different pieces of expertise working on a paper that is itself like a synthesis of a whole bunch of different experiments. Um, you have a lot of things that look really similar. Um, it's perfectly possible to make a lot of errors. What it's not possible to do is to take a larger base image and then have two overlapping cuts of the same image. It's not possible to do a stretch or a distortion. It's not possible to do a rotation unless you physically go into photo editing software and actually perform the tasks. So, in general, these are split into entirely different classes of distortion. So, I mean, if you have an old Western blot and you're like, well, this is a control lane uh, and this is, and we just sort of assembled it piecemeal. And you're like, well, there are splice marks in here. It's the, a lot of the time, that probably means nothing. But some, especially if you've got one great big panel 
And you see the fact that the great big panel is like all the little tiny elements have been moved over and there's one in the bottom left and suddenly it appears six times in the top right and they're pixel identical. You can't, you physically can't trip over and, and do that. It's, I mean, we've, we've had data cases that are like this before. Um, aggregate mean A plus B is not equal to the mean of A and B. What does it mean? It means it isn't right. Full stop, end of story. Um, the mechanics of its not rightness is separate entirely. But I mean, this is the, the, that's, that's the first point I'd make, is that they're entirely unwilling to admit that there's a distinction between different types of error. They just go, oh, a question has been raised, and it goes into the big bucket of potentially not right. And I think this lack of sophistication that they bring to that particular table really serves the inability to act more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, they don't, I, I hadn't realized until I talked to some people, you know, from the publisher's side, that there are things that I would regard as, you know, absolutely clearly everybody would agree is beyond the pale. And they don't get it. You know, they, they, they really don't. They think, oh, well, you know, some people don't quite like that or whatever. Um, and they don't see the damage that can be done. So, the, James, you were speaking at that other conference that then just by chance dealt with a lot of these issues, this Cree conference or computational, what was it, computational? Computational computa research integrity. Yeah. Research integrity. And that was a meeting which had Elizabeth Bick and there. And the other person that was very interesting was Jennifer Byrne, who's picked up on similar sorts of things. And also both these wonderful people have identified these paper mills that churn out these fake papers by just generating nonsense. And her field is not so much the... Um, Jennifer's field is, is more these sequences, these gene sequences that are, are wrong again. And, and she made, I thought, a really good point in her, she gave a really great overview. And one of the points she made is that from the publishers and journals point of view, they are completely focused on the author. And once the paper's out, you know, it's out. But they're, they, they're very concerned that, you know, they're not going to upset the author and they want, you know, to get the paper out nicely. Whereas she said the readers are concerned about the paper and about the paper being accurate. And the, you know, so the, the publishers and people, once the paper's out, they're very, very reluctant to go back and take it away. But I feel it's like saying, you know, you have a cake stall and you've got some of these cakes on your cake stall that just happen to have, unfortunately, some toxins in them. Um, and you discover this and you think, well, better not you know, say anything about that because the chef might get upset, you know, or might sue me or something, you know, and it's sort of like, but the cakes are going to poison people. And to me, this is what it's like, that they're putting stuff out there that's poisoning the uh, record, the academic record, and they're just letting it stand because they're worried about the person who made the cake possibly getting upset about it or feeling that their reputation is, you know, upset. And the other thing that we brought up at that meeting, which um, I thought was really worth pushing, is that they're very scared of, quite rightly, of, of you know, legal challenges, of, of authors, you know, coming after them for libel or impugning their reputation. But what they need to do, and a number of people are suggesting they really could look into this, is, is maybe have agreements, just as you have to sign a copyright agreement when your papers yeah. are could you not have a legal agreement rather like a prenuptial that, you know, says basically if we discover something dodgy in your thing, you know, you are not allowed to sue us. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I don't, I don't know how to agree. I'd have to do interpretive dance to agree more than I'm about to agree with you in words. Um, that is, is that it's, 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 it's perfectly possible. And look, the amount of stupid crap that's already in the publication process, and like, oh, we don't want to add another form. That's obviously not the reason. You quite like those. Uh, likewise, um, I have, I have offered on more than one occasion, I will sign an NDA to be able to look at your de-anonymized de data, if you have so much fear of it actually getting out, I invite you to retain the possibility to take civil action against me if I do anything with this data that's not reanalyzing it and sending it back to you. And again, you can't get people, it, it, you can't get people to be interested in that. Even though, so look, I, I sign now, in my job now, I sign an NDA going out. I have an NDA coming in that I've sent out about twice a week. It is very, very routine. 
It is extremely straightforward. I'm absolutely certain that they use them in their internal business. But for some reason, when it comes to the actual mechanics of what goes into making up their product, all of a sudden, the normal facets of uh, information control within business suddenly disappear. And it, it, is sim- it is simply because it is easier not to. Um, a fun, fun side point, um, Dan and I both went to uh, the University of Sydney for our PhDs and neither of us ever got to meet Jennifer Byrne. And the reason I took that panel is that I wanted, I wanted to meet her in the first place. People already know what I think, but I'd, I'd never got to meet her and I admired her work for ages. Um, and it's, it's very, it's very cool. Anything that's a computational, a fully computational tool within this area is always progress. It's always cool. Um, so I mean, I, I do, I, mean, I do want to modify something that you said though, because it's, it's really interesting. I was reading about the, um, uh, I've been reading a lot about the historical center of the Hans Eysenck and Cyril Burt cases oh, yes. recently. And uh, because, I mean, it came around again. Anthony Pelosi gave a talk on it um, about a week back, which was super. I, I I didn't learn anything new because I'd already read all the stuff he wrote, but um, it was really nice to see it get that kind of format because, um, I mean, it, it's been it's been around in some form since the late 1980s, and that's crazy. Um, the thing was though, when they were talking about, uh, there was, there was a senior professor who wrote a letter to a journal, which I will have to dig up for the show notes. And the problem with assessing the magical data that Cyril Burt, uh, was reporting in papers over time. And then what became the problem with the collection within the BPS? You mean uh, rather than Burt or? uh, uh, well, just getting to him. The, no, 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 no. The, the, the environment that was left over from oh, Bert right. was 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 this dude saying, "I don't want to go around passing judgment on a like a dead guy, a man who's not here to defend himself." It's all because I mean, because we had all this fuss about the Bert thing, and now I don't want I don't want to do that. To, I don't want to be involved in doing that to poor old hands. The point being, of course. Like, not only should you be less concerned with their reputation, because it's quite difficult to hurt their feelings now, um, but can we have a simple discussion about whether or not what is being reported here is possible? You can think whatever you want. Maybe he was a poor record keeper. Maybe he didn't care. Maybe someone else wrote the number down for him. Um, Maybe. Maybe the data existed and he didn't bother reporting it properly. Whatever. It really doesn't matter. The things that are in it aren't possible or are so vanishingly unlikely as to be practically impossible, which is more or less the same thing in this context. So why is why is what we're seeing here, the discussion around this, about a referendum on the dude? I don't care about <laughs> I don't care about the guy. I care about the graduate student thesis that's based on some idea that came up. Or a very good point I hadn't thought of until recently. Um, the fact that there are still ISENC results that are within the kind of King's College investigation results that end up in meta-analyses now because they're considered to be part of the overarching body of literature on a particular subject. Now, I th- I thought when I started... Uh, thinking about this in the first place, I guess I was wrong because I thought this was all entirely in a historical context. It was more sort of like, what do we do if we don't cite it anymore? And people immediately went, no, James, not that. It's still going into things because that's how aggregation over time works. People like Dan, who have nothing better to do, are going around aggregating lots of different results in meta-analyses, the same way you're always complaining about, and these results are in those. Mm. So that's scary. Yeah, I don't want to monopolize your episode, but this is this is no, a lot of this has been a lot of this has been happening recently. I tell you, I did learn one thing in that high anxiety talk that I, I found shocking, and I hadn't realized was there was this crazy thing that there was then this special issue of this journal that Isaac had founded to sort of somehow celebrate him after his death, and somebody invited Pelosi to make to write a 
an article for it and he was a bit surprised. <laughs> he, he produced his article and he had lots of loads and loads and loads of reviewers, apparently, that he went through many cycles with some loving it and some hating it. But in the end, it was accepted. And then he, he sat there waving the, pr the proof of this thing, which was pulled at the 11th hour. So it got to the proof stage, mm -hmm. and then the editor-in-chief said, we can't publish this. Oh, wow. Wow. So, <laughs> and he then, he then touted it around, he said, you know, quite a lot of other journals, and nobody would touch it. And then he found a journal in the end that did publish it. I think it was a journal of health psychology or something. And that, it, you know, it was an absolute documentation of all the stuff he'd covered about these dreadful papers on psychotherapy for cancer or psychotherapy for sorry, heart disease. But, you know, trying to argue that it was your personality type rather than you know, the fact that you smoked that was getting heart disease. Yeah, the, the, his, his phrasing is something like, uh, if, if true, some of the most consequential, consequential medical research in human history. Yes. Um, the, the, the component part of that being no one in the social sciences or the medical sciences has ever acted like it was true. No one has ever looked at this body of work, and there's def I mean, one of these uh, there's uh, I think maybe twenty or thirty uh, individual papers that were coming out of the same omnibus data set. No one has ever behaved as if they were true. No one in any government or, or public health body has ever said, "Well, that's interesting." Um, yeah, let's get everyone's psychotherapy and start handing out unfiltered Marlboros on every street corner because they don't do a damn thing. Um, it, 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 it has never been acted on or treated in any way as if the, as if there was something that you could follow on from. Um, it's just cited occasionally in, in, uh, there areas that are usually one or two degrees removed from where the original papers are. I, I find this with, I, I had a good look the other day for an old one sync paper that had, 140 citations, I think. I'm not sure of the exact numbers. Approximately 140 citations when it was retracted and now has 190. <laughs> and, but of those, of those 50, um, a, a good few of them are saying, well, I mean, people tried looking at this, but this paper was retracted. So that's bad. So that's a citation, but others were, I mean, it more in sort of, uh, business marketing kinds of areas where they're not going, oh, the actual nutritional research in the at least quasi-nutritional journal that we all heard about was retracted. And this goes directly back into what you're saying about the moral obligation of the journal to make sure that the external, external appreciation of something is maintained and accurate over and time. Yeah, and it's and it's largely because if it's not, people you know, waste everybody's time trying to build on it. And, and in the case of the areas such as where Jennifer Byrne is working, where it's cancer biology, I mean, you think could have really consequential results. Um, but it's also the sort of with the Isaac thing, the it's the sort of sheer cynicism. I mean, it's just like current politics, uh, where there's nothing more corrosive than seeing dodgy people getting away with it. It really just contaminates all of us because that's the one. I, I know. Um, you, you, you know, you get this when politicians, well, in our, at the moment, our politicians keep getting away with things that 20, 30 years ago, they, they would have, would have been resigning matters. And I'm sure that's also been true in, in the US. I mean, it, it, a little bit, a little <laughs> bit. And, and you, you feel it's, it's really, really bad for all of us because you start thinking you're an idiot if you do things right. Because why, why not cheat? You, you know, there's no consequences to cheating and it gets you ahead much quicker. So you, you've got to, you've got to have some sort of, I mean, I don't want to sound too much like a sort of, a, you know, the, the, the old phrase about the sort of nasty sort of, you know, data detectives and trying to go after other people and police their behavior. But if people are doing things that are clearly fraudulent or wrong and there's no consequences, it's very, very bad for all of us. Yeah, the, it, it's funny that that perspective in the sort of general public discourse. Um, I feel like in the last couple of years, it's gone away. I uh, I I haven't been uh, I haven't been called anything rude in a good eighteen months, at least. Um, I, I think one of the reasons for that is reasonably straightforward: is that that in my little coterie of weirdos and the things that we still occasionally do when I have had sleep. Um, 
it it just kept going. I mean, there was the nutritional stuff, there was a whole bunch of psychology stuff, there was criminology stuff, um, and I had uh, involvement in a, a, a few things that were from other different areas I still probably shouldn't talk about. Um, and then recently some sports science stuff for me, and it just kept happening over and over and over again. I think people have a tendency to personalize things like this, you know? standards for everyone else except for me and when they see it sort of moving about or it doesn't directly affect them anymore all of a sudden it becomes normal because you just keep doing it and you keep moving um uh what you just said the fact that the the, the non-maintenance of standards is a great breeding ground for cynicism i think apart from the fact that it's very difficult to get ecr jobs I think that's probably the single most common thing I've heard from people who are leaving an academic tradition at an early stage is the fact that I, I feel like the bastards are rewarded and whatever I'm trying to do here doesn't fit within the kind of remit of how I feel like I'd have to act. And I'm, I'm cynical about getting through the processes because that seems to be something that cannot be removed from the heart of the processes. Um, and in general, there's some, you know, people have their own injustices perceived or otherwise, but they, regardless, they are from that place. If you're liking what you're hearing, there are a few ways that you can support the work that we do when everything hurts. First, you can throw some of your spare change to us each month, $5 to be exact, and you'll get access to a bonus episode every single month. There's also a $1 tier that will get you access to the Everything Hurts newsletter and the occasional bonus episode. Second, we've got a merch store where we sell hoodies, shirts, and coffee mugs, which is our most popular thing that we sell, so you can tell everyone that you listen to the best science podcast in the world. Third, you can tell your friends about the show by sharing links to episodes on social media. James and I love seeing these posts. For links to our Patreon page and merch store, check out the show notes. I think another part of the problem is how we conceptualize errors in that when you see the retraction notice, whether it pops up in Zotero for you or whether you see your retraction watch um, post, and the first thing that you go to is, oh, there was some really bad, bad fraud going on. <laughs> I actually saw a, a story, um, I think a week or two ago, in which someone was um, was asked for their data and they're like, sorry, we don't have it. And they're like, what, what happened? Um, my laptop was stolen. And they're like, sure, mate. Sure, it was stolen. And they ended up producing um, the police report going that, yeah, like three months ago, my laptop was in my car and someone stole the window and it was stolen. So, in, in, in this particular someone, case, I'm telling the truth. Did you say someone stole the window? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they stole the window as well. No, so they, they stole the window. They, they stole the laptop. They, they stole the stole laptop. Now, th I think there's another issue there in that uh, if you're only storing your data on a single laptop or a sting or, or a single hard drive, there are some other other issues going on there. Um, but 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 all all that to say, there are different types of errors and because all these different types of errors whether it's a, a genuine error like getting your panels mixed up which is fine and which is going to happen or a kind of a photoshop error it all gets put together and because it all gets put together people are very very hesitant to kind of go hey I'm, I, I made a mistake here but i think that if we had some sort of system where you could say um, I, I think I might have mentioned this before, but it's almost like a traffic light system. A green retraction is when the author puts a hand up to go, hey, I made an error and everyone knows this was an honest error. Of course, things aren't black and white. So you have to have almost a yellow traffic light system or, or a yellow retraction where we go, you know what? We're not a hundred percent sure that this was an honest error. There isn't enough evidence to suggest otherwise. So we're going to give this a yellow. And the other alternative is like a red retraction where it is very, very obvious. Like the, like the case that, that James brought up where there's an Excel spreadsheet with formulas, which makes one group, uh, exactly 2.3. <laughs> 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 um, those are very like that there is no way that you can explain yourself out of that. So if we have this system, which actually classified retractions, I think it'll make it a lot easier because people are more willing to go honest error. I retract my paper or honest error. He, he, here's how I'm going to fix this. Yeah. 
And I think uh, I, I think uh, it's getting better already. That and this was another thing that people did talk about at this pre-conference about you know if we we need some way of not just saying this is a retraction, but but giving some sort of explanation for it and so on. Um, uh, one point that was made that I think is fair enough, which is that a lot of editors have no experience of dealing with retractions because they're sufficiently rare, so they don't know how to handle them. Um, and in fact, there was there was a recent case where there was a problem with something in a, a journal that I was reading, and I I made a fuss about it, so probably on my blog. And the editor, it was quite funny because the editor came back and said, "Oh, you know, I'm going to try and pull that immediately." And I said, "Hang on, and this was not a case of a clear." Fraud. It was definitely one of those sort of marginal ones. I said, I found myself advising this person, saying, "You could get sued. You might want to talk to your legal department before you just pull it, because um, you know you do these editors really, you know, even if they want to do the right thing, they're not always able to do that uh, so easily. So um, I think that just sort of lack of experience and not getting much guidance from anybody else as to how to handle these situations is one issue that could easily be addressed by just sort of giving people a bit more training but also making i think retractors just should be more common i think you know and, and they should not necessarily be seen as an indicator of you having done anything wrong because people just make mistakes and if you get something into the literature with a mistake in it then it needs to be removed yeah absolutely um it it is the, the 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 thing that's very central to the perception of this as punishment rather than screw ups uh, is the 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 sense that you can define a wrongdoing from it, which is very rarely the case. Um, something that journals do not help themselves in actually assessing because the vast majority of retraction notices say something super informative like we have decided to retract this paper um why look over there that bird i think it's purple um you know and then there's a doi at the end of that uh there are uh, exceptions of course but i mean the vast majority of the time is the we spend, I wish I could remember which paper it is. I have to find this out because I've, I've told people this several times recently in public and I, I keep searching for the name of which one it was. It was four years later that this thing got retracted and a retraction notice is not like, this guy emailed, <laughs> well, actually it was Nick. This guy emailed us every three to six months with new analyses and updates on all the other retractions and everything else until we finally actually did something about it. And the retraction notice has no backstory. There's no context. It's just that, this this has gone away. Why has it gone away? Well, we don't want to we don't want to give that out. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean that is, is just the sheer number. Of, some, a lot of these people are repeat offenders, and that was the other thing that made me laugh about the paper that this sort of Society for Microbiology sort of defense of their behaviour was like they were saying. Well, sometimes it's a very long time to investigate because there's many many papers that have been flagged, and you think. Hmm. Well, if many, many papers have been flagged, you know, like how plausible is it that they're all just honest errors? It comes to the point that, you know, maybe three strikes and you're out. I think that was the sort of Elizabeth Bick view that you, you get to a point where you can make a couple of errors by mistake. But by that point, you should actually, you know, perhaps be a bit more cautious about what you're doing. If you've had two papers picked up and flagged up for error, then if you're still making those sorts of errors later on, even if it is just that you're completely incompetent, you should probably should leave the field. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, uh, Dorothy, I, I love how how measured you sound. When you, I would say the same thing. The language would be so much more intemperate. It just sounds so much more official when you say it. <laughs> um, actually, I want to. Um, I want to find a retraction notice because it's look it's not as if this never it's not as if this never happens um that that you don't actually get the right kind of uh you don't actually get the right kind of context so i i want to i want to read you uh a retraction notice that i was involved in this would, would be a couple of weeks ago and this, it might be the best one I've ever read. It's in Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise, which I'm sure is not a journal that uh, either of you spend a lot of time reading. Um, I don't myself, it has some crossover with work, but not, not a great deal. 
Um, and it's on a uh, it's on a resistance training paper uh, that was that was uh, it had some problematic data features that is far too lengthy to go into. Um, uh, we're re- retracting this article because of concerns about the veracity of the data. Good start. Some don't even go that far. Two authors of the article raised questions regarding the data of the article and requested that it be retracted. Other authors and their institutions were contacted and permitted to respond. Authors and institutions reported no irregularities. At the request of the EIC, four content areas with statistical expertise investigated the data in detail, considered the author and institutional responses provided evaluation. Based on their reports and all pertinent information gathered, the data were judged to be highly unusual, correspondingly dubious, and insufficiently trustworthy. We 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 follow the Coke principles. Mic drop. Right. So it's perfectly possible to do. I know yeah. people don't. <laughs> there's, there's there's templates for it. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not as if that you you can't find anyone who's ever had to deal with it before. I don't. I know everyone's busy. But how much component importance do we want to attach to this? Mm. And opinions differ on that, but I think the answer is more. I mean, the really dodgy thing that I think is, is even more worrying is, is these paper mills, which it's unclear how far what's been turned up is just, you know, the occasional weird group of people generating fake papers or whether there's just the tip of the iceberg and i get the impression that some of the people that have been discovering this stuff reckon that this is really massive um and that there's there's a there's a lot of stuff that is just outright fraudulent and partly motivated by the fact that what i did learn at that meeting was that um you know in there are chinese medical institutions in particular where if you want to train as a doctor if you want to actually get qualified as a doctor you have to have not just a publication, but a publication in a sort of reasonable impact journal. And most of these doctors are not interested in doing research and they don't know how to do research. And so they just buy one of these things from a paper mill and they're quite expensive. And so somebody's got a nicer learner there. Um, and it's really, well, it's, it's like sort of people that will give you fake degrees or write your essays for you. And it's, it's just like the next level up, you know person who will do your assignment in college for you except that this time it's somebody who'll produce a paper that will can be publishable in a reasonable ranking journal it's possible to do to a certain point um yeah i we could we could do a whole episode on um we could do a whole episode on paper mills um i i wrote a Actually, I thought, actually, I was, I was thinking of you when I wrote this as one of the few people who's made forays into scientific fiction. Um, I actually wrote, uh, a fictional piece about this with Otto Kalikowski a while back. Um, about like how we thought it went down in the guy's head who does this, because this is, it's one of those situations where there, there are grades of these. Um, the, the bad ones are genuinely terrible. The kind of mid-tier ones are designed to be undetectable within certain limits. Um, and the amount of, and I think the, the amount of attention to detail to do a good one, I'm not sure how you'd know. But the existence of bad ones and noticeably better, but still detectable with the right methods, but also being maddeningly unable to prove it once implies that there are very definitely good ones because they definitely exist on a continuum of quality. It's more than one organization that's producing them. Most definitely because they all, they handle different areas of scientific endeavor. And. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's just the, I don't think anyone read it and it sank like a stone, but it was tremendously cathartic for us, uh, to, to write the, the story of, the, of, of John, John the paper mill. You should, you should put it in the show notes anyway, if it's up anywhere. Yeah. Well, Otto wrote all the good parts. I, I wrote a, a, a pretty much an extended like 3,000 words of, um, huffiness and screaming that was appended to the end. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's because it's, it's one of those maddening sort of hill guards dilemma kind of things. It's very, very difficult to be able to pin that down. And that's, that's why it's really dangerous because it's completely fake. Uh, and it's also capable of being scaled. 
And of course, that's the, only the, ones the, are the ones that are not very good at doing it. Um, so you wonder whether there are others who are just so good at doing it that, that they never get detected. Yeah. These things are happening in a lot of the medical sciences, but do you think this is happening in the psychological sciences, in the journals that we read or the journals that we generally read? That's an interesting question. For some reason, I don't. Uh, I, I don't know why I don't uh, think that, but maybe that it's it's easier it'd be easier just to sort of gather the data wouldn't it than to sort of invent it i don't know um i don't know why i don't think it but i i i don't i don't think i don't think either but i i think i know why ah it's because the local detectability of it the amount of people that need to come in the resources that you need to the the environment in which that would be done, the amount of human contact, uh, the, the the paper trail requirements are far too stringent. It's very difficult to pretend that you've got three hundred people to do something if there are local record re- keeping requirements. A lot of this, uh, a lot but of the paper mill stuff, it, will do exactly that. Didn't he invent hundreds of subjects? Yes, he did. And he would have got away with it if it wasn't for those meddling kids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it's like, look, 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 look how that turned out. Um, yeah, he, it was, it was, it was similar. Uh, but that wasn't, that wasn't a mill. That wasn't a third party. He was, he was, he was doing it himself. Um, and that was really, I mean, when it when it came right down to it, that was the center of the implausibility. That was the center of that. There, before he just sort of confessed everything, that was the center of how difficult it was. Like, where did the data come from? Show me the receipts that the people existed. Show me the expense reports. And it makes it very fragile because you generate a lot of documentation when you have a lot of people coming in to 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 do something and tissue and animal experiments especially in parts of the world that don't have uh really strong arec um committees and procedures um it's it's treated it's treated differently yeah yeah i think it's yeah reason yeah Anyway, it's like I'm spec I'm speculating wildly, but I have thought about it before, and I don't. Um, but uh, th- there is a degree. I mean, some of the stuff that Joe Hilgard was dealing with a little while ago, um, which was uh, it. It it looks as if it is hard to believe that the experiments were conducted as described, but. The thing was, I mean, he looked right into it and all the work is like it's 5% figuring out what happened and 95% trying to get someone to do something about it. It's not that it was computationally challenging. Um, so, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, so, but, I mean, that's, and that was like sufficient to get things in front of editors and actually have a discussion about whether or not it happened in the first place. Um, all you're relying on a lot of the time in, in paper mills, in general, it's a couple of things. Um, it can be like internal contradictions within the papers between text and figures. It can be reuse of uh, figures, and, figures and graphs between uh, individual papers. But people who are good enough to, like the second tier that, uh, that I was talking about, um, I feel like they have enough experience to modify things slightly. And it slightly is really not enough. Um, it's also it's also made easier by the fact that I mean there is just less physical actual data. It takes up less bits when it comes to what is the what is the biological data. And I've never heard of an investigation go, you know, prove you prove you have that particular piece of microscopy equipment available. I don't, they, they don't ever seem to go that deep. They just sort of uh, they they tap out. Uh, well, well before the uh, prove you have the infrastructure possible to be able to do this point. Although they shouldn't, <laughs> I don't know. It's maybe that's far too serious of me. Oh, Dan, Dan, we're being depressing. Dan, say something lighthearted. Well, uh, one of the 
one of the people who's looking very looking very closely at paper mills is um a guy or we think it's a guy he call they call themselves Marty Morty sorry and all, and all, all that's revealed in their Twitter profile is Morty is is a Norwegian researcher I've had a few people asking me are you Morty I, I'm, <laughs> so I, I, I want to say I I, <laughs> I want to say I'm I'm not I'm not Morty um I mean because they deal especially with with stuff that's completely out of my field but Morty's doing a ton of work at um at uh, identifying paper mills and some of the stuff is just 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 it's, it's jaw dropping so we don't know who, who Morty is I guess we also don't know how they get funded because this is the other big issue is that quite often the people that are doing all this work are not doing it you know for any sort of reward and then it's not part of the day job so uh you end up sort of getting obsessed about it and following it because you want to put things right but it's not sort of yeah i mean that well i suppose this is again what james has said i've heard him say it before you know you really need people who are funded to do these sorts of investigations and that's their job because it's just ridiculous relying on us i mean what tends to happen is you stumble across something because you're reading something and you think that can't be right and then you, you go deeper in and you start to suspect it but it's it's we really need more resources dedicated i think to just checking the record as well as uh, you know the other things we get paid to do how good do you feel that your sense is um james has said a few times that more often than not when he sees something fishy and he digs a bit deeper it's almost it's almost always something that's very very fishy but for you dorothy like when you see something and you dig a bit deeper how often do you actually find yeah this is really really sketchy or how often do you go oh wow i i actually got something wrong here I think quite often I end up just thinking, oh, God, I cannot be bothered to go through this anymore. Because quite often there are things that... <laughs> yeah, I think that's the sane and sensible response. <laughs> yeah, you, you just sort of, you, you sort of, I mean, there, there's one person who's, who's, I think, I'm sure there's something dodgy going on. And I've been very much trying to find out what is going on. But the work they do is so bloody boring and pointless. <laughs> you know, I just sort of can't be bothered to fill my brain with it beyond a certain point. You know, so I look for the easy, low-hanging fruit of, you know, what might be wrong. And then I think, no, I can't find anything there. So just let it go. But it, it's, um, that, that is the difficulty with when you are trying to check, check, check up on things is, is that quite often you, you do have to, I mean, you have to get things right. And so you have to do things very, very carefully and not jump to conclusions. And I sort of, I, I think I just got only a few years left of, sort of research time anyway. I don't really want to spend it, you know, like it's like cleaning a sewer, really. It's better, more interesting things to do. Yeah, this is but yeah, this is this is honestly that exact response is why the, the only thing that really interested me about the work is not punishing the people, you know. Oh, James, do you really care about a material science researcher in Tehran? No, um, not really, not heaps. The interesting part is the way you find it. It's the puzzle. That's what that was. What the the focus on techniques was always about is because those are the things that continue to be useful and compelling that might actually reveal something elsewhere. That's the only way it's going to live and continue to live. It's not about punishing people. It's about jailbreaking data. And it's also, I mean, then it can be quite fun, uh, to be honest. And it's more like doing crossword puzzles. So the the most interesting thing that I ever stumbled across was this a ring of dodgy editors who were you know and i was able to sort of just show that this trio of people all published together but all their papers by them that the lag between submission and acceptance was incredibly small it was often less than a week when they sent journals to this papers to this particular journal and then there was a sort of reciprocity and you know you find that and think oh is it really You know, it, it was sort of play. It was just the sort of same playing with data I and mean, playing with sort of bibliometric data, um, rather than the sort of data I normally handle. But it had the same interest in just trying to understand what was going on and to sort of suddenly crack it and see what they had been doing, which was really quite clever actually, um, because it was it was really quite hard to you know it wasn't obvious to the to unless you delved a bit into these publication lags, which. Um, you would have difficulty doing unless you could sort of scrape the data in off the web and sort of start looking for patterns. 
Mm. Uh, um, you actually you actually don't need to scrape it. If you use the advanced functions in PubMed, you can you can mass download things like that. Right. Um, I I have done previously looking for uh, impact factor manipulation. But uh, it takes have, it takes a while dates? because a lot of it's quite often, mm-hmm. it's quite often actually difficult to get the date of uh, uh, submission and date of acceptance. They they have them when they're reported because they're a field that you may or may not fill out for any given journal. Um, so a, lo- a lot of the time they do, I can't remember more than just a bare couple of examples where some copy editor obviously stuck them on the document, but they weren't in the official record that was tied to the DOI. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, you said you said crossword puzzles. I think of them more as sort of uh, uh more that more is tabletop puzzles or number puzzles. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have time anymore, but I've always been a fiend for different number puzzles. Um, and you now I we like wake up in the morning, and before I've even had coffee, you know, I'm waiting for the kettle to boil. I'm like sitting sitting in the kitchen doing kakara puzzles, and it's yeah, this is a it was a product of mental restlessness. Um, and yeah, so 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 are the tests. In a in a sort of an ongoing sense. No, and and, and that, I mean you've also. I mean I was hoping from the stuff I did that I might devise some sort of general rules for how to pick things up that were you know where, where something odd was going on, particularly with editors in this case. But um, I don't think I su- have succeeded in that. Whereas you've been able to put out a sort of general thing that's actually useful for other people. So I think then there's a huge point in it if you can if you can actually produce some sort of tool like that can be used. Yeah, then it's just convincing people to, uh, you know, people would people would love it if there was a big red button and you could push it and it'd answer all your questions and everything would be straightforward. But um, we are quite far away from that because facts. But also, you know, as soon as, I mean, it would also be as soon as you had the big red button, people would get clever enough to sort of start modifying things, just like with plagiarism checks, you know, they start changing a few more words so that the plagiarism checks don't pick things up oh yeah 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 absolutely you always you always end up you always end up in an arms race um it's yeah people brought that to my attention many times i generally have two responses to that one is never underestimate the pure venality of people who are doing this um, <laughs> doing doing the, the dodginess of this in the first place but the other is we also have the entire historical record of before right now and that's still interesting it's still not going away and in, in the vast majority of cases it's still as perfectly preserved now as the day that it was actually laid down in the I first mean, place to the Isaac stuff where you know you look at it now and you you know the impossibility of those results it just you know once Pelosi points it out to you, you say yeah this is this is just ridiculous you know these effect sizes that are being reported are way out of line with anything that you could possibly get unless there was some miracle in you know this leaflet that they were at one point giving people I mean that was the other thing that I hadn't quite appreciated that it you know that the treatment for stopping you getting heart disease to change your sort of psyche started with one-on-one intervention with this guy that worked with Isaac and then it, is that it? it was about that it was a, no 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 that's just a piece of paper it was about it, that it long sort of group therapy but then they thought that's too expensive so they decided they'd give people this leaflet saying this is <laughs> how you should think about the world and suddenly you stop having heart disease it's been the most I mean, incredible it's- finding in medical history <laughs> yeah the only the only way a leaflet will have that much influence on someone's life is if you soak it in LSD and have them eat it <laughs> it is just not going to happen no. We, uh, we're going to wrap things up for this episode. Dorothy Bishop, thank you so much for joining us again on yeah, Everything Hurts. You. And, uh, yeah, we hope to have you back on again another time in the future. Anytime. Always ha- nice to chat. And uh, thanks for keeping up the good work with the Hurts, uh, Everything Hurts podcast, which I enjoy as I tramp around. I'm having to tramp around Oxford to keep fit in a lockdown situation. And I love your photo uh, challenge. This is great. What? Your, your, your Oxford photo challenge. Oh, yeah. Well, you see, that's part of the tramping round. I mean, it's very boring. I mean, Oxford is beautiful and there's lots of interesting things to look at, but it's still, if you keep going on the same routes, you get a bit bored. So I started photographing things to 
sort of try and see if people can recognize them and that's been quite fun but uh, the, as i do that so you'll be pleased to hear i'm often listening to you guys hey. so. <laughs> there you go i'd love the idea of these big beautiful vistas and uh, 16th century pieces of wrought iron with me complaining about <laughs> publication bias in a s- semi-sober Australian accent. Ah, oh, that's a lovely... I think that image will hold me for a few hours. 